don't remember that till grade four. I can't miss it. You know, you're just tripping over it. Something is very nice. Thing. And it also touches on a ground base to the talk, which is that 
I have a feeling looking back at some of the work that we did around the late 60s and early 70s that we were very much in parallel with certain artistic movements at the time without realizing it. Um, and in particular, the, the, the um, aesthetic searching that one feels in uh, Milner's art. I don't really know these drawings, but they, um, Solowit does literally hundreds of drawings taking an idea like the random placing of lines one centimeter long or straight lines of random length or um, 100, something like 5,000 two centimeter lines on a sheet of paper or whatever it is. They're kind of programmatic drawings um, which have a kind of spare direct quality which um, begin to link back to some of the work I think we were, we were looking at in, in, in that period. Um, I'm going to describe four projects that are in what might call the expected territory of um, the political ground period. period. Um, and because of the nature of this war generation that we were, which was the 1979 out of our federal school around about the early to mid-60s. Um, the last generation was in which um, they made in national service, quite interesting, so we were probably um, quite young, young at the time, compared to the previous generation. Um, we were then subjected to a very strongly programmed course which developed architectural ideas by increasing scale. So that in the second way you were building, third way you were small town, fourth way you were a giant housing scheme somewhere in London. And then you were kind of encouraged to do something even bigger. Your thesis, so you didn't, didn't do that. Um, and this, in a way, gave people a taste for doing big schemes. And it, in a sense, that's quite dangerous today. Because um, in the outside world, the social program for housing, which was really where most work was coming from, demanded of people to have ideas about very, very big projects. And many of the architectural practices, I think, people didn't know what to do. Or even more particularly, the local authorities and the local authority architects didn't know what to do. So they have a generation of energetic architects going out hungry for a big project with uh, a curious alliance. I think there's quite a number of very big projects that have done. I think we just come out of school because they went into a, an organization and weren't afraid of doing it and said, yes, we would love to do a huge, huge house. And so it's a period where there's the alliance between um, the end of a social program for reconstruction of the war. Um, the, that being virtually the only outlet for architects, schools, housing, hospitals, that kind of thing. Um, and as I say, a an idea for teaching the air, which almost specifically developed film that role, um, providing with this taste and this expectation that you could get straight on with a very big house or a very big school project. So that they do that. So, the, the four schemes that I'm going to talk about are the first two are housing projects, and as I say, most of the work that we got involved in that period was housing. I think sort of by default, um, if we've gone into another group of offices, it might well have been schools, it might have been something else, but it was housing. Um, the third scheme is the competition for Northampton, which came more or less at the end of the official period of time of being a group. And then the, the fourth one is the reconstruction of Captain Car, which I suppose begins to reflect from a personal point of view that the things I really enjoyed weren't necessarily the things that might be the best known to in that period, but were odd enterprises that one got involved in. And I put these two slides up to evoke the, for me, what, the, what kinds of things were pressing on one's imagination as, as points of inspiration. On the one hand was the 
design, Poetry and Modern Architecture, which was put together by the citizen. Very brilliant publication. A function of which I think, because I in fact worked with citizens a very similar period of time, was to stop people or kind of close the events of the early modern movement and not to encourage people to get involved in that kind of aesthetic. But the images were so seductive that one exactly the opposite happened. One actually grew back into an interest in the purpose of the thirties. And then in parallel, there was the books of Everett York, Modern House and Modern Flat, which is a picture of the modern house, which again were full of um, very, very tempting images. <coughs> evoking a kind of ideal modern life to do with spacious inside and outside relationships, um, furniture, kind of whole lifestyle, which um, one imagines being able to impose on society as a whole. talking very briefly about the small housing scheme. Working as we did as a group in other people's offices, all the work from the grunt group, the primary competition, all the rest of it, actually done not as practice, but as employees of other people's office, in other people's offices. And the principal employer of us, the builders, is actually the management department, um, a very tolerant office with quite a lot of housing work. Um, that were quite happy in a way that some of the design direction might be taken over by not exactly parasites, but by people who, whose interests weren't simply the furthering of the previous McMahon's work, but, was, but were actually looking at their own, their own direction. And in my case, um, I cut my teeth as an architect going through the whole process of designing and building a project on a small housing project in Rothheim. Um, in a group of Sutton Dwellings Trust Charitable Housing, um, a linear block. And very simply, the, the idea was to, the, the, the motive behind it was to make some kind of analytical um, solution to what might be called the kind of the problem of housing. That is, it, 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 it uh, connects to, I think, a, 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 something that one was tending to do at that time, which was to take things to the first principles and find solutions. And at the same time, one was also um, reacting, usually against certain things that were happening at the time. So that it was a tendency to have very deep, horizontal, maybe net blocks with long axis starting. One starts to feel like there's another way of doing things, there's another way of making more intimate connections. So the first one here is a simple linear block facing away from the street, opposite a garage building on top of which is a garden. And the real crux of the project was to try and make something special out of an access system for half the flats, which just puts two flats together around the core and make that core um, very convenient by giving the lift each pair of flats. So we're now into a curious area of politics. All this had to be done within what's called the housing yardstick, the, the, the Park Morris standard. And um, it became a, a, a matter of will to get things into the scheme, like the lift of two flats, which is absolutely normally not possible. Thank you. So that the crux of the project is really in the handling of this flat plan. Um, looking at putting together a lift and a stair that needs to go with um, a, a, a sort of compact horizontal plan, I suppose in, in distinction to the way in which maisonettes make tight, compact organizations of rooms, so that there are um, potential connections between living rooms, kitchens, bedrooms, um, a kind of openness, uh, 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 a kind of modernness about the interior, uh, an idea for a window that goes right across the front here, which is, has no mullions, no fixed mullions, but is three-track three track sliding window that can 
move large areas of glass to one side. Um, a lot of implied style decisions about living alto stools out of a table. Next, please. And compare that with the open version of the plan where the doors slide back, there's free space between all the living spaces. Um, Eames chair and perspective. Um, all of this in the context of the lowest income group in the East End of London, um, in a charitable housing trust area. And I think in doing these drawings, one, one sincerely felt that the project would engage people to live this way and actually to have changed their taste. Somehow they would come to understand that this was how the project was supposed to be used. It was very difficult to achieve under the, as I say, the strictures of the yardstick. And in a funny way, it was um, almost pointless because the people who chose to live there uh, didn't live in that, but didn't you, people who, who were brought in to live there, who were on a kind of housing list, with poverty, had absolutely no thought of living in this way whatsoever. Next, please. So at one level, there's an idealism about setting up something which means that you have the family with a kitchen um, overlooking children playing at the same level on a, on a garden, on a, on a roof of uh, a garage. Um, there's an idealism about pure frame and about that pure frame being completely free of the glazing. So the glazing can slide about and completely open the front window to the, to the living room to contact the garden. All of that has a kind of idealism about it, but that idealism has absolutely nothing to do with people who actually lived there. So that these pictures were taken shortly after it was completed. Very soon after that, the attendant locked all these doors and never left a child on this top ever again. Um, all the windows were sort of fixed shut and were immediately covered with uh, uh, gauze and netting. And uh, most of the sliding doors were screwed up and all the rest of it. So they, there was an extraordinary mismatch of intention. And I think that if one extrapolates that to a lot of the housing schemes that were built at that time, I think that mismatch, that feeling that there was an, um, an idealism that could be communicated through the projects and would be taken up by the people in the sort of social movement, um, was quite widespread. And if one wonders why a lot of the schemes have failed, it's in part to do with that kind of, uh, uh, I mean, genuine hope things would work, but actually lack of observation as to what would actually work. Next, please. As, as part of the social intention for the scheme, one went and personally went and got the client to go and put, a, say, the children uh, daycare place in, in the building so that there was a way of imagining that the whole of the family life problem had been solved, that you could see the children playing, you could go out to work and leave the children on the way out in the, in the, in the same children place, um, but one had a, 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 a sense prescribed a whole way of life. And it's, it's, in the, it's in the aesthetic, it's in the turning away from the street, it's in the sort of detachedness of the scheme and the self-containment of the scheme. Um, um, as, as a design and as a kind of social idea. The garden has grown up here and is immaculate because no children were ever, ever played there after, after about the first week. Next week. And I want to jump from there quite quickly to the present um, in, in a couple of steps. The first one is to look briefly at the project that was mentioned in the introduction to Marks Road, which is still within the group but right at the tail end, and it covers the moment of going off and starting practice separately uh, with Noah. Um, and I think the, the, what in the inter happened in the intervening period, this is between 19, roughly 1965 and 1975, um, was a gradual disenchantment with the actuality of the, the impact of the modern movement way of thinking on the city as a historical animal, as a living thing. 
And time and time again, one would go around the corner of a relatively pleasant area of London and find builders busy knocking something down to replace it with a long net slab or whatever. And that got to the point where it was really quite sickening. Um, or, and, and sickening to the point that you had to do something about it. And it's very quite difficult to get across that the teaching of the AIM was so strictly in the modern movement and so morally placed in the moral move, modern movement that there really was, it, it, there was no way of looking over that horizon. You actually, there, was, there were things you could do and there were things you could definitely not do. So to step outside that prescription was really quite difficult. And this is a small housing scheme, again, for similar charitable trust in North Kensington, um, where that emotional reaction directed one towards the street of houses, intuitively, what's wrong with the street of people, how that's how people seem to want to live. And that simple proposition of the terrace of houses interpreted, to some extent, in the light of modern images and references, but also to some extent in relation to the context, because there are similar house types around in that area. Next please. And the sort of things that become important in this scheme are the layers of privacy that exist between a pavement, a gate, an entrance step, a porch, and a bay window, all of which have graduated relationships between public and private zones in relation to the way people live and expect to live. In other words, it starts not with this abstract ideal, but with an analysis of the expectations that people might have and the way they might live in the city. And inevitably, there's a conservatism about that, because people tend to re re replay and reproduce the patterns of living that they've established. So this is quite an important slide, because it, expresses, it looks at that zone between gatepost, front garden, entrance step, uh, projecting bay window, and regards those as the ones that hold the primary messages of the scheme. In other words, that all this stuff, which is before you get into the building, is in a way more important than anything else in the project. So the plans that come out of little narrow houses here, which are very ordinary, simply don't matter. They're rooms back in front of the staircase, very ordinary. That relationship between the plan and lifestyle has been reversed. Next, please. And perhaps most important of all was the preoccupation that one placed on oneself to acknowledge the difference between the front and back of a building, so that the street generates a street facade, which is a whole place in its own right. The two sides of the street have more reality as a single place, a single object or single composition, than the front and back of the buildings themselves. So there's a deliberate and almost overkill uh, concern to make the backs absolutely different from the fronts. And <coughs> that is very much against the spirit of the way the modern movement thinking tends to make buildings happen, or was doing so at that time. The problem-solving aspect of project tends to make unique solutions, tends to make buildings which are seen as separate or in the round or distinct from their neighbours or have something about themselves that um, is more important within its own territory than it is in relation to its adjacencies. So that the moment of, um, of giving that up and allowing the street as a place to sweep across the project was quite a sort of difficult one to handle. All of this now looks extremely conventional. At the time, it was quite clear to observe that in the social housing program and the sort of, um, general local authority housing program, the post war period, there's almost not a single example of a terrace of houses in the rebuilding of London. It's a very extraordinary thing. Next, please. And out of this came a theory supported by various writings which points out a simple fact that London is very different from other European cities. London's a city of houses. Other European cities are concentric in their development, have very dense centres, have flats, have an urbanism which pushes out into the public places so that there's a balance between public life and private life in, let's say, Paris that's in favour of public life. London has always been able to develop freely, not been constrained by walls. The chosen common element is the house. It's this diffuse, 
collection of villages. So the fundamental of the understanding of London is that it's basically a domestic city with a preponderance of interest in the domestic life and an, an, almost an embarrassment about public life. Um, you, you know, the street, eating in the streets is only just happy. All, all the evidence is there. The, the, the main streets are unimportant. The streets at right angles, which have got housing, in, are the important streets in London. There are a whole lot of characteristics like that, which take you to um, a way of seeing um, London in, I suppose, typological terms. Uh, well, it, it gives you a way of reading London, which is consistent with another development that was going on at the same time in, in preoccupations, which was the interest in urban, urbanism in more historical ways. And I think there were quite a lot of false analogies being made between urbanism in other, other cities of Europe uh, and London. Um, and one came to be quite strongly preoccupied with this particular way of looking at London, which unlocks a lot of the conundrums about the way London um, comes across as a place. Next week. Um, in relation to that, the, the Rachel uh, Wynery um, sculpture, which I don't know really, I hope you all saw before it came down, but had a particular poignance for me because um, here was a sculpture that literally represented the remnants or the, the disappearance of the terrace house, the individual house, the basic great sort of basic language of London. But in making a sculpture out of it, um, turned it into a radical modern object. And in a sense, that would have been the ideal thing to have done with a new housing scheme, to have taken the underlying thing but translated it into a radical object. Um, I, I certainly don't feel ever done that. I mean, that's work that's yet to be done, I think. But this does it in one move, so that you get this extraordinary feeling that this is composed um, with the kind of radical geometry that one might expect in, some, in, in a scheme that's done by someone who's doing it for purely, for, for completely other motives. And yet all it is, is a cast, a literal cast of a house with the fireplaces and the wallpaper still sticking on. Um, so I found it very particularly touching, strong, strong image. Indeed, I find myself imagining in the solid concrete, as you can read it as solid, frozen the lives and the, the actual people who occupied the house. Next week. <coughs> and I want to jump right forward again to a project that's been around for some time now, which is the Opera House, simply to draw that thread of repair, the motive to repair a city, as opposed to make radical changes to a city, to the quite tricky problem of a, a, a dense central area, still a square that's basically residential, that's Covent Garden Square, Inigo James' great urban contribution. Um, and just to look at this scheme, and then another scheme, the scheme in Leeds, um, in a comparative way, very briefly, in terms of the motives behind the moves um, in those two schemes. And I want to use that then as the platform to go back again. So I apologise for straying from the main subject for a bit, but it allows me to, to, to take a point of view, retrospective point of view. So in the case of the Opera House, I think all I want, want to draw attention to is the motive to repair the square, to find some way of handling the new bits of the Opera House in a way that it uh, allows the building to be both new and part of its historical, it, 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 the obligation that might exist for it to be um, recognize its history. And the point here about Covent Garden Square is that it's a very odd case that um, it's an extremely important urban um, place, very well documented, but virtually none of it exists. Um, all these buildings no longer exist, and yet there's a strong obligation to replace them. So one's put into a curious historical dilemma, and the, the obligation is not only intellectual to oneself, but is a powerful force socially. There's no question that some kind of historical replacement would be demanded of you in working in that area. So a project which has to remake a theatre, make an entrance off the corner, look after the existing theatre here. Um, labelled a theatre project in many respects is more a town planning project looking after the edges of streets, squares um, adjacent places um, and finding a way of doing that that negotiates both a historical requirement and 
um, an obligation to be of one's time. Next, please. So, being very summary about it, there's a simple diagram of completing the arcades, producing a new entrance into the theatre, developing new foyer spaces in this area, and a formal idea, which is that the edge of the square is dealt with by one kind of building, which is itself an arcade and a loggia at the top, which gives you a framework within which to complete the square, but outside which, at roof level and beyond, is free to develop as a building in its own right. I'm partly putting this on the, sli uh, on the screen now because today we put in a new application for the Opera House that's absolutely current. There's a whole new set of developments in that project that's quite likely to go ahead after the long delays. Um, so the way I'm, I'm testing to myself that the basic principles that were in the early scheme still apply and can be developed in the way in which we've been looking at them recently. Next so it's an immensely complicated scheme to do with theatres, to do with stages, to do with all the trappings of a, of a big theatre. What we've recently been able to do is to remove those parts of the principles of the original project, um, all of which is, is, looks very optimistic. And in a way, there's a summary idea expressed in this painting, um, which draws attention to the way that people who are in the theatre for a performance might, as audience, also be a kind of another kind of theatre audience with things that people go on in the square. In other words, there's, there's the theatre as being part of an urban idea which can be added on to the literal theatre of being in the opera house. And it's that kind of uh, uh, double twist to the possibilities of developing the theatre which start to take on particular interest. So, portrait of Nella in the corner. Um, I mention that because there are portraits of the others later on, so it <laughs> may make things uh, even. Next. Week. So we come round to where we are now. We have, we've we've ha done, uh, we're about to build the first part of the scheme, which is a piece of arcade with its history, with a background building which is more to do with developing things freely. And round the corner is a facade to James Street, which is an exercise in quite reductive brick technology to make an elevation that is somehow um, simply reflects in, in a fairly strict way the discipline that might come out of working with brickwork. And you can immediately see a certain dilemma that we've got into by, both, by being both obliged to repair and um, also being people of our time and wanting to develop uh, a proper contemporary architecture. Next please. I want then to turn very briefly to uh, the Leeds Art Gallery just simply to make a comparison. In the case of Leeds we're dealing with the end of a terrace here which is part of a very long rather curious square with a town hall at one end, an art gallery, library, and we were asked to put a new sculpture gallery in that group of buildings. And that could be said to be very similar to Covent Garden, um, similar question of making an urban place in important parts of the town. But the, the history in this case is very odd and very different. What in fact we finally discovered had happened was that a square that used to exist the front of the town hall had been expanded by cutting away a huge piece of the town, severing this terrace um, rather dramatically at this point, thus exposing a series of public buildings to a square that they never built to address. So those public buildings acquired new facades. And in the light of that piece of history, what we're doing is completing what is like a healing process to a, a, a square by putting a final facade on the end here to make an entrance into a new gallery. Next please. And I think that, that, that to, to simplify the description here, that um, the thing that triggered thinking about this project in a particular way was in part the fact that it's called a, a gallery for modern sculpture, but was also um, a, a, an exhibition at the Tate of the North on the Minimalists, 
um, which, having dealt with the Opera House project for some time, was a salutary shock of clarity, reminding one of certain um, modern intentions, modern aesthetic, um, which became developed as an idea for an entrance, which left, represented the cut through the terrace and placed a programmatically developed object on the front to make the entrance, which is simply the pattern of steps as the fall of the ground goes across here, a single material is greeted in different ways, polished and flamed granite. Um, uh, an absolutely uncontextual object, but the product of a contextual observation about leaving evidence of the dramatic change that's taken place at the square. Next, please. And the aesthetic developed here is one that is associated with galleries, uh, reductive detail, um, experimenting with combinations of materials. Next, please. Next, please. And in part, um, a discovery through this project and a reminder of something I'll come back to of the way in which many ideas are, uh, have an accidental quality to them. Um, one of the most interesting things about the project was something totally unplanned. That is that because it's the existing building, you penetrate through the building to arrive at a new gallery in a courtyard, um, thereby <coughs> going through relative dark spaces before you come to the special daylit space that makes the new gallery. That simply has the physical effect of opening up your pupils as you move through the gallery, approach, approach the new gallery, and as you turn into it, the effect of daylight is of a quite dazzling and extraordinary kind just an accident that comes out of it being a conversion um, it, it, which imposes on you um, a, a, a system of windows that you would not normally ever uh, choose to use. Next please. And again, the Soldoid exhibition with the big doors to the gallery open. It's an extraordinary presence about to march out through the door. Um, and the nature of the elevation with its five rows of steps, five windows and five chimney pots. Again, it's a kind of reductive, programmatic idea. Next, please. That's the wrong one. It's gone the wrong way there. Uh, just reminded in relation to that project, the, the uh, an example of the use of the accidental at uh, Alpinic Tech in Munich, where the damage was left evident after the war with flattened bricks and the, uh, all the detailing stops and is replaced by a very simple representation of corners and representation of downpipes and behind that the marvelous staircase. I put that in because its intention is quite close to, to, to the Leeds project, but and I, I don't think I knew about it before, but I may have seen it. And I'm getting interested in this connect, how, how you pick up ideas, what, what sort of seeds are thought in your mind. Next, please. I want to turn from that backwards to go right back to the beginning again, to the period when we were all working together. And the introduction to that is just a reminder about this uh, exhibition of the sculpture. Um, Soloit or Sarah or Morris or the various other Flavian, um, which somehow communicate very powerfully an aesthetic um, reminder about certain things that one had been preoccupied with in the past. And to some extent, I feel, without making too elaborate, much of an elaborate point about it, I think that we were quite close to all that in, in the early work. Next, please. And here I'm turning back to competition done with Chris Cross, 1968, for housing, ostensibly part of the social program about social idealism, but I think in many respects primarily motivated by artistic ideas. Um, we were very preoccupied with not saying things, not being like a village, not being cosy, not, not, not having all the sort of... Uh, comfortable triggers that might make something acceptable, but to be rigorous, analytical, um, but at the same time to find something that expressed 
poetry. And the idea behind this project was to lay a grid of what we call streets and paths at right angles to them across the random, and again, if I say accidental, shapes of the landscape to produce very particular shapes. And this image of Yorkshire field divisions and walls is very close to the aesthetic idea. Next, please. 2,000 dwellings. So that the plan is long straight streets, couldn't possibly bend them, couldn't possibly turn the ends so that they make spaces. That was absolutely, for some reason, never understood why. But first thing people would say, why don't, why don't you close the spaces? Why don't you turn the ends? Why don't you do a few things? Those are the things that were absolutely unacceptable. What was acceptable was to let trees that exist make this space wider than the others. In other words, an accidental thing again, as found thing, was allowable to adjust for a hierarchy space you might make a centre to set against the linear streets. And I really don't think, well certainly, I, I, write the others, but I really don't think I knew what I was doing, why it was such a preoccupation, but it was an absolute preoccupation. And it was, there was, a, there was a, a sort of, you know, there was no question about it, that this absolute, this, this pushing to an extreme was what really mattered. And the notion of street was to have houses above the street here, so you could go in and car underneath and come up into your house and have a garden here, all of which in theory works very well. Um, but I think there's fair evidence that the poetry that we were looking at in the overall layout couldn't be continued and contained in the physical actuality of the building. So that the buildings, in a sense, the, 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 the um, actuality of making the buildings just couldn't be brought up to the same level. And I think it could be said without much um, the fear of embarrassment the others that none of our buildings of that period actually really worked. I mean, they, they fell far short of the ambitions that they were setting themselves. So in a way, what one's looking back to with interest is what those ambitions were. Next bit. Plans which are very preoccupied with things like through living space. You have a garden and you seek a, a staircase plan which allows to have a through living space. Absolutely repetitive patterns of party walls, um, absolutely no differentiation, um, and total confidence that it would be all right. Next week. And developing in long sections, very fond of these long sections. These are, a, a lot of these drawings are drawn by Chris, who's the, uh, absolutely master draftsman I and mean, he has really fantastic fluency for draftsman um, so you get the, the kind of general scale of the street to the shared communal garden space to the street the centre etc etc I think we were very seduced by this kind of drawing which developed um, something to do with landscape something to do with the English landscape and indeed I think one of our conscious points of inspiration was the relationship between geometry particularly axes um, in in the English landscape tradition, so that you get this juxtaposition of the geometrical and deliberate and the natural. Next week. And I put in here um, a slide of Seven Doughty Street, which is, again, we were kind of very uh, introverted group. You all, well, Chris didn't live here, but the other three of us lived here. Um, Fer and I had a flat here, Ed had a flat up here. Mike Gold lived in the back room. Um, and uh, uh, competitions were done there. Um, and the reason I put it here is that when we were talking about these long streets, we would say, look at the Georgian Street, look at Gower Street, look at these places. It's all right. You can have this very long place, and it's fine. And that process of analogy was enough to support. There was evidence enough to support the idea that you could have a very long street, and it would be all right. The fantastic degree of subtlety that's actually in a Georgian street and the subtle variety and the connections with wider urban fabric was sort of lost in the argument. Um, next, please. I want to turn from there to a sort of related project which inevitably was quite closely developmentally related, which is this uh, large housing scheme of. Um, Milton Keynes, 
what happened was that we moved as a group to Milton Keynes. We were invited there by the chief architect, Derek Walker, um, because he needed some big schemes done quickly. So, you know, we were, we were probably good for the list on that one. Um, and we readily went there and did some very big schemes. I think totally disastrous for the point of view of the people who live in them, but they remain quite interesting. Um, here, the layout is the same basic poetic notion. The grid set against the contour, and again, I didn't point out before, the very important cross geometry of the threading of paths suggesting destinations. Very much, I think, something that comes from the Smithsons, who were always so evocative in their use of paths to make subtle points about the layouts of projects. But in this occasion, instead of making a street, we made a block with the fronts facing outwards, streets or roads along each side, and a sort of public space in between. So you had big public spaces in front of houses and a big garden at the back. Absolutely wonderful. Should be perfect. And that was set in relation to another furthering of the sort of absoluteness of the geometric notion, which is that all the tops of the roofs would be on a horizontal plane, so that the houses developed from small houses to large houses programmatically through the accident of the fall in the land, giving you the numbers, and you dig around with the levels to get the right numbers of large houses and small houses, and you've sort of got it. Again, you've never made more... I suppose you've made the minimum number of arbitrary decisions. You've set something up which narrows the focus of arbitrary decisions. And I've been sort of wondering about, as I say, my renewed interest in the minimalists, and realised, of course, the minimalists were working exactly this period, 65, 75, exactly when most of the creative work of the minimalists was done. And looking, threading through a book yesterday, next piece, found a rather extraordinary coincidence, which is, this is about 1970, this scheme. This is a sculpture by Richard Serra in 1970, which is the placing of horizontally topped metal pieces against the shape of the land in a landscape situation where you get this interaction between the blade of, of steel and the um, romance of the landscape. Now, whether it's an accident or whether there's nothing to do with each other or not, but it's quite an odd coincidence. And it allows one to wonder whether the motivations in these schemes, as I say, was more artistic than practical, more artistic probably than social, because having said it's a social program, we had absolutely no interest in whether people liked them or not. So that we weren't really interested in society, we were interested in something else, which I'm not quite clear how to define. <laughs> Next week. No. So, an evocative pair of pictures is Mil uh, the Milton Keynes project, Netherfield, looking basically sort of all right, because there's lots of bushes in the way, and you see the horizontal top disappearing behind the trees, coming back again out here, and it looks pretty good. It's hell to live in, but it's... Um, <laughs> looks all right from there, and this view of the Sarah sculpture where it's brought into contact with the planting, so that the planting and the, and the object start making a point against each other. Next week. And so we have the plan with its centre, uh, its low buildings, its high buildings, um, flats, which couldn't be fitted in because they weren't houses. They get pulled out, and they're a bit of an embarrassment. But um, paths, trees, rows of trees. And on this centre, there was to be an arcade. And to be strict about it, the arcade is a crib from the Smithsons project for street in Somerset, and which was never built, which is to do an arcade of concrete blades with a heavy top which might have planting in it. And there's something Again, very evocative about, I mean, the scheme probably never looked better than the point at which that arcade stood by itself in the middle of the fields. Um, next, please. So, I want to turn from that to another project of that period, again, sort of to end towards the end of the period, um, to do with Northampton. This is really a lot to do with the motorway. Go up the M1 to... Milton Keynes takes about an hour. And we had this extraordinary routine where we were expected to go and work up there every day. 50 mile journey there, 50 mile journey back. Fine, you're going out in the country, it's going to be a nice day, all the rest of it. But the 
some killer was that when you got there, you expected to work in a windowless box. They'd made a factory unit with no windows in it, and the architectural department was in that. So you went steaming up the motorway, um, expecting to be in the countryside, and found yourself in a, in a, in a box with no windows. And uh, some of the things that are wrong with the Netherfield scheme, I think, has, are a direct product of the, the whole thing being wrong, the, 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 the um, sensitivity of the place to its people being wrong. Anyway, the next stop up the motorway was Northampton. And having and really been extremely frustrated working on Netherfield, <coughs> there was this big competition, which turned out to be the next motorway stop up. So it was incredibly tempting to go and have a go at the county offices for Northamptonshire as, as a competition. In fact, we all went in for it in the first stage. And the second stage, um, Ed and I and Fenella worked on. Um, and the ideas here, for me, I think, are a wish to break away from the prescriptive and narrowing focus of the work that, that, that's typified by Runcorn and, and Milton Keynes. I think, um, I think if one had had a way of seeing the artistic possibilities of that earlier work, there might have been a way of going on with it. But not, not, not knowing about the, the kind of parallel artistic movements and not having anything else to hold on to, it sort of evaporated, it came to nothing. And one therefore turned much more to what might call more extrovert architectural enjoyment <coughs> in looking to a scheme like this. The main focus of which was to place a local authority uh, headquarters in a pyramid, a glass pyramid, next to what is a spiral mound of cars, and to put that all in the language of English country landscape planning, axes, broken axes. Um, indeed, to be interested in the placing of objects in relation to a wider landscape, the site being here overlooking a wonderful view from the top of the hill. Next, please. So that the, um, the pleasure here is to, um, I suppose, just because what happens with these talks is that you find yourself thinking through something you haven't thought for, through before, but I suppose it would be to reverse the process whereby you try and avoid making arbitrary decisions and in, instead to make deliberately some big arbitrary decisions which could be just said to harness some kind of enjoyment in the project. So that there's a deliberate thing about the pyramid, about access up the pyramid, looking across the landscape, the drama of entering a building in this manner and looking away, um, the experimentation with a parking idea which is deliberately uh, 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 um, an exploration of the way in which the geometry of cars can be exploited, that is cars are obedient, will take up shapes that you define for them whereas obviously people won't. So in every car park, there's a potential piece of geometry. And in this case, let's say the spiral mound has a certain logic to it, because you can pursue the spiral until you find a place, um, and then walk off, walk off the mound and, and go into the building. But the aesthetic preoccupation was, within, with the, was, con was the conjunction of the crystalline pyramid with the randomly constructed cone of cars, arbitrary in its, I suppose again, accidental, in its, uh, appearance, depending on where the cars park, but those cars are part of an uncompleted geometry. Next, please. And it was a project that had jokes in it and things like that. It was obviously the local authority hierarchy. There was a, a, a tubes that went in and picked up certain dates, like the accounting year and things on the account, chief accountant's desk and that kind of thing. So it had a certain, but I think that frivolity was part of the wish to get away from the Milton. You couldn't have jokes in the Milton Keynes scheme. It just wasn't possible. But, so that it's like trying to expand the territory in some way. Next piece. So that in the, the diagonal section, you come into the building and go up in a glass lift overlooking the distance at the top of the hill, looking across a wonderful landscape, all of which was quite exciting. Interested in the, an entrance which uh, splits its axis between going up this lift and going into a main library building underneath, producing these counter geometries. Next, please. And a very definite um, looking at 
the actual drawings of, in this case, capability Brown, but other people, Bridgman, um, for compositional ideas. And indeed, the shapes in this capability Brown, Brown drawing are so similar to the shapes in that first plan that I showed you with the star amount that there's no question that looking at the book, one had imprinted it and drawn it without realizing in a very, very similar manner. Next, please. And I want to turn from here to a, a brief contact with more recent projects which pick up some of these ideas, particularly the one about cars. And um, the, the thing which, in a way, quite strange that cars are still always bad, car parks are always still bad things. I mean, everyone will say you hide the car park, there's something wrong with the car park. And yet cars are quite elegant things, and I think they're quite, always pretty well kept. Um, and obviously in the Northampton scheme, the idea of car park as a positive thing was, was one, of, one of the themes. Here, there's a, a brief reference to uh, a, a Sainsbury's project, which we're currently working on, um, on an extraordinary site where a motorway outside Plymouth um, meets the railway going to Cornwall, meets the River Plym, um, dividing a site here between the site available for Sainsbury's from a kind of, a, the absolute opposite, a place that no one can get to, a wilderness. <coughs> and what we were asked to do was to provide a scheme that would be regarded as romantic, as dramatic, by the citizens of Plymouth, because it's a city that wants to bolster its, its self, sense of self-worth. And the problem was that you could see this site from a mile away. It's, it, it's at a huge scale, and a building even as big as the Sainsbury's doesn't register at that scale. So we became preoccupied again with the idea of the car park as, as the thing that had a positive content. In this case, making the car park a semicircle related to the proximity of the entrance, and then to back that car park with a giant arcade of sails which deflect the wind over the car park. But the connection to the previous project is this feeling that the car park is something that has an inherent geometric possibility that can be harnessed and made into the big thing that registers in the landscape. Next, please. So that as you come down the motorway, what you see is a semicircle of trees and the, the sails running along the edge of the car park, with the Sainsbury's virtually sort of hidden, not unimportant, totally unimportant, behind it, on the basis that Sainsbury's know what to do with their shops. What they don't know what to do is, is their public image and their car parks and the way in which you arrive at the place. Now, this is a project that um, Ed and I have been working on over the last couple of years. It's now on site. Um, and it has a particularly touching history in that the idea for these canopies was one that was developed by Peter Rice, an engineer who died recently, and died before he complete really working on this project. Um, and what has happened is that the project got into a certain position in his hands and then has had to be transferred to other hands. So I think it's got in it some of the ideas that were important to him, but he would have taken it on further. So the sails are now, in this form, they're Teflon sails stretched across a compressive, twisted grid of steel members. And I think the thing that I find interesting about this is that we've got this in the scheme as a means of getting the message of the scheme across. Plymouth might find it an interesting, exciting thing. <coughs> it virtually has no function at all. It's really a piece of public sculpture, um, which Sainsbury's are paying for, and it's the most unexpected and curious situation. And it has some of the old ingredients. It's a long line. It's as long as it can possibly be on the site. And that interest in length, dimension, using the whole site, straight lines, um, taking something to extreme, connects back to the previous work, and yet it's quite different in many respects. Next, please. And the thing that I think we found intriguing about this is that um, almost by accident, and I never <coughs> asked Peter Rice in the development of these shapes whether he had this concern as well, we have in fact got a public sculpture which changes its appearance as you move past it. Now it's actually to be seen from a moving car, from a tr train, or whatever it is. So this is actually the same model from different angles. And I find that 
Again, we're in a very interesting area, somewhere quite close to sculpture, quite close to artistic intention, of finding something that works aesthetically under these particular circumstances of movement, move, movement in different manners, past the side. Next. Um, and the last project that goes back to the base is the reconstruction of the Tatlin Tower. Um, there was an exhibition in 71, 71 I think, called Art in Revolution at the Hayward Gallery. Uh, Michael Braun was the designer. Uh, and it was probably one of the first times a very large amount of Russian uh, revolutionary work, constructivist work, brought, brought to London. Um, the Russians were reluctant to let it out of their country and indeed put quite particular restrictions on what could be done. Um, one of the restrictions was um, no models could be more than scale of something like 1 to 20. So you know, what they were imagining is the houses would be quite small and you wouldn't get anything that was too, too, look too powerful. What they forgot was that the Tatlin Tower was intended to be 1,200 feet high. So at the same scale, you could do it 40 feet high. So Michael Braun, having spotted this, came and, came, came and asked for whether we could uh, find a way of reconstructing the Tatman Tower and then building it 40 feet high on the uh, terrace of the Hayward Gallery. Um, I think, can you try whether that's the right one? I may have missed, got one slide wrong here. Um, yes, there we are. Um, the Tatlin Tower exists primarily as the most kind of commonly presented image is this constructed elevation on this, in this manner. As you'll know, it's, it's meant to be like a House of Parliament and these four solids are supposed to rotate once a day, once a month, once a year. Um, it's supposed to span the River Neva in Moscow. Um, it's a giant, extraordinary idea. But when you look at a drawing like that, it is extraordinarily difficult to work out what in the hell is going on. Um, and a task set oneself was to make small models and find a way of reproducing in three dimensions what is implied by this drawing. Next, please. And that's only possible when you go through a certain piece of detective work. The actual geometry of the Tatman Tower has hidden inside it a cone of 24 members, off which all the radiating bubble style <coughs> geometry is projected. And until you know that, you can't start to unpick what's going on. So there was a, um, a period of searching and detective work against the timetable. That is, the whole bloody thing had to be up in three months. Starting on something, you didn't know whether you could make work at all. Um, and so this started, with, with the thing was from beginning to end extremely exciting, extremely immediate. It was practical about making something. And it was also about interpreting, uh, interpreting something. And I think that that's um, a consideration that goes back to the idea of problem solving from first principles. And it's like comparing being a musician to being a composer. The role of being able to interpret something is actually a very pleasant one, because you don't simply reproduce. You do actually change it through that process of, of interpretation. And we were working, in this case, uh, with Chris Woodward, Chris Cross, Fanella was involved, I was involved, um, and Sven Rindle, who's a marvellous engineer, now retired at Samuelis, who was a sculptor. He was an artist, and he was very, very good at drawing. So he set about drawing all kinds of wonderful diagrams of how the, how, how the Tatlin Tower worked, the way in which it might be a beam that cantilevers out of the ground, propped, and then wrapped around on itself. Next, please. Um, how the various planes might work and interact with each other. And there were dozens of these sketches, obviously, can you show selection. And indeed, one very, very interesting one. Tatlin drew that drawing absolutely geometrically. He will, the proposal is that these should rotate, but that shape won't rotate inside there. So it's a very odd conundrum. What, what on earth was, was kind of, again, I think it's very evident that Tatlin had a large artistic license in the project that he put forward. Next week. And on the one hand, Sven's wonderful freehand drawings calculating everybody's connection. And a picture of Tatlin building his own model where you can see the cone, which <coughs> is taken out after construction. And that's without, that's the clue 
that tells you how to do it. And without that piece of evidence, it's virtually impossible to make and remake the tower. Next, please. So, um, I think we're out of sync again slightly. If that could go back on. Yeah. I just want to put the, the idea of us building the wooden model against the Taplin historic photograph. And the whole thing was made out of plywood and bolts and joints and washers and God knows what. It was built inside the Hayward Gallery and then taken to pieces and built very quickly outside. And it was, it was an extraordinary thing to do. It was, it, it, if I look back to that period, the most memorable thing, it was, it was actually doing that. Next week. And you can see that we, we brought it up onto the, onto the, hay, the top of the hill. And this is the former that held the 24 radiating members, which are here. And they're in natural wood and are cut out at the end, leaving the, the red members um, as, as the sculpture itself. I think that's me. Next, next piece. Out of which, at the end, when the thing was finished, I was able to take some photographs, which I find intriguing because they completely reinterpret and uh, remake how one might perceive the Tatman Tower, which until then one only has evidence of in the drawings that Tatman made himself. And one gets a sense of the kind of drama that this 1,200 high, 1,200 foot high object might have had if you were within it, if you were actually uh, uh, seeing it at its true scale. Next piece. And I speculate from that that one gets preoccupied with spirals, double spirals, finds a project like the Opera House, and invents a place that you can have a double spiral stair, which is, was for a long time a central idea in the uh, Opera House project to make a vertical foyer space. Um, and again, <coughs> looking at the mental process, which half knows what it's doing and half doesn't know what it's doing. Next, please. And in a sort of similar light to do with things which are made in a very direct way, um, there's a house that we did, again, just verging on the end of the period of working as a group that Clara and I worked on, um, on a wonderful piece of landscape, curving landscape, that was located right up top here. And in the distance, you could see a thing called the Golden Ball, which is a, a very eccentric monument on the hill. So this is a house with an axis towards that monument consisting of two massive walls off which are propped simple pieces of wood in such a way that the curve in section here and the straight line in plan here produce a double curve in three dimensions, a warped plane. Next piece. And once back again to this business of the curve, the straight line, the playing of the two <coughs> against each other and the very strict economy of means to produce a quite complicated effect. Next piece. I want to go from there to a project that's now building um, in Cambridge, a study centre for Darwin College at a, a long narrow site between the River Cam and Silver Street such that a curved wall faces the street and a straight line faces the river and both those shapes are as found they're in the site itself. Uh, an idea for a lower floor with places to work with computers, and an upper floor where you read and write. Becoming a building with a series of carousels split by staircases, above which one develops a roof that's produced by this juxtaposition of the curve and the straight line. <coughs> Next piece. So that the wall, which is rebuilt in its old position again, well, a similar thing, the remaking of the as found. The curved wall here becomes the curved wall of books inside the building and the stairs that go up to the reading places are walls of books and the roof above takes on this double curved shape and in a very obvious sense is reusing an idea that wasn't built because the house wasn't built. Next piece. And in this is a um, preoccupation which I think also goes back a long way which is the balancing of repetition, that is the repetition of stairs and individual places, with ends, end conditions. That is that this double height entrance area makes an entrance. You get the rhythm of repetition. You then get a stair that goes up to a special place at the end, 
a little tower, and then a mirrored window that looks infinitely projecting the linear um, direction of, of the scheme back into Cambridge itself. And that kind of compositional preoccupation, I think, has, I'm not sure, it has something to do with, with um, things inherited from, from the earlier project. So it's a project entirely made of, well, not, the, the structure is made of oak, and the furniture is made of oak, and the exterior panelling and windows are made of oak. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, a building that's also exploiting a reductive view of materials. Next week. So it has an elevation to the street that's very passive, possibly not terribly clever, and a more expressive elevation to the river with the whole oak structure perched on a base of masonry. The site being this extraordinary site here on the cam. Next, please. Next. And a couple of pictures taken today going up to site to, site to argue about something. Um, the thing is actually building and what is very intriguing is it's made of oak but it's actually made of uh, green English oak it's cut specially, dried and therefore has split in the most dramatic way so it's wonderful huge pieces of timber that have split and the jointing system is a combination of the traditional in the sense that pieces of wood lock into each other but the way in which they are held together is, is modern technology using uh, stainless steel bolts which cramp the thing together and indeed the technology of this building is more difficult to assess than a high tech project because nobody knows what oak will do indeed we're, we're sure we're still, still going to find out, find out the worst because it may move extremely or it may not nobody knows, all the joints are designed so that they can be tightened up afterwards and there's a, there's a sort of clause put into the thing that someone will go around with a spanner in a year's time and tighten up all the bits next please I'm going to go whizzing right back to being a student um, doing measured drawings. And this is a measured drawing of a thing called the Great Laxey Wheel. It's a wonderful uh, industrial object on the Isle of Man. Here, working with Chris Woodward and Fidella and myself, in our second to third year, um, rather heroic, heroic piece of work. Again, rather like the Tatlin Tower, probably the most memorable thing almost of all the student days because it was such an extraordinary thing to do, such an extraordinary enterprise. Um, next, please. And something about the tower at the back, the spiral connecting back to the spiral, and slightly sort of far-fetched connection to the recent project that very much been to do with Ed <coughs> and we develop the kind of original competitions very much together, competition ideas together. So in a way, this, this is a project of some sentiment to the present, because it's the first project that we've completed in the new practice, which is by a new client, completely, there's a competition one, part of ourselves, um, built and completed, and, and in many respects looking, I think, quite interesting. And it's particularly interesting, I think, in this view, because it, it is still got the scaffolding up, and there's a an odd feeling that it's a repair job on a Renaissance tower and yet there's nothing about it that's not strictly um, matter of fact in its practical approach to it being built so it's 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 quite interesting he has it both ways almost going back to that dilemma about how you could find something that's both historical and acceptable maybe historical isn't the right word that, that doesn't destroy an urban context, that's for instance, say for instance, and at the same time is of its own manner. Next please. I want to end with some um, <coughs> pictures which very kindly lent by Birkin Howard, who used to take photographs of us, which are contemporary photographs of the four of us. Um, this is Chris Cross in a characteristically res resolute frame of mind. Um, Chris is a wonderful humorist. I mean, actually, it struck me that both Mike and Chris are famous and humorous. And Ed and I did sort of sat, did most of the sitting and laughing, I think. They were very, very, very extraordinary in that level. And I put alongside it pages from that AD um, that summarized the work 
done during the time of being with the Manus office. An incredible piece of arrogance. Imagine a group of assistants publishing under their own name the work of another office, an office that they've gone to sort of nest in for a bit. And it really caused terrible upset at the time, and quite justifiably so. Anyway, this competition wasn't done as a McManus project, it was done a half of ours. Um, Ed, we were discussing this the other day, and this is an illustration of the awful catching nature of ideas, we're discussing this thing about the relationship between the compositions on these pages and the content. And I suppose my feeling about that is that the pages are designed in a similar manner to the scheme. That is, you've got to make use of the whole dimension of the page, um, you've got to summarise things in a certain way. Um, there's the importance of the diagram. Um, the whole balancing uh, act of putting a scheme on a page was itself an important thing. Can we just one on this side? Just by, for an apologia for a more or less <laughs> contemporary photograph. And then go on the next one, both. Um, these two competitions, the Runcon competition and the Portsdown competition, I think in a way are the two schemes that summarize um, most poignantly the sort of searching, odd searching that's going on for an absolute, for this running of a complete thing to, it, to its extreme. Plus in these drawings, I think a very good example of the um, preoccupation with a very selective drawing, so that the way in which the paths were free and the edges of the slopes are free in, in this, against the regularity of the built object. In a way, that to me is the most poetic image of that scheme. Remains of preoccupation still do this drawing, still search for that kind of relationship. Next, please. And Ed was working with Mike on that project, and we found this quite typical photograph of Mike Gold, um, uh, more or less contemporary, and indeed Chris Cross. Um, um, and it has to be said that um, things don't change, I suppose. But, um, uh, on, on the left is the summary page that was the preface to that AD magazine. Um, really doing the same thing, of looking at shapes paths, basic physical forms, um, summarizing, taking almost like an art form, the summary of projects, um, in a manner that we knew exactly what was important. And if someone else tried to do it, they'd get it absolutely wrong. You know, unless you completely shared the aesthetic preoccupations, you wouldn't have a hope in hell of doing one of those drawings, because they are about a particular selective process, as between geometry and freedom, um, pre-composition, pre paths, roads, enclosure, um, whatever it might be. I feel with Mike, the, the, one might sort of extrapolate from this, a, um, a, 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 the sense of being detached from the ground is perhaps quite close to the sort of um, un unreal position that we were in with these projects, which was that they were uh, almost could never be achieved in the manner that we were setting out to do them. Although it does occur to me that if we'd had the patronage we were involved with was a very negative one. They were dreadful committees, dreadful people. You know, nobody really, we had to do everything against, against the tide. If that work had been done for a very outgoing, understanding patronage that gave the money to do the thing properly, engaged our interests in a proper way, I think the work would have been built in a totally different way and it would have come much closer to the... Um, I think quite interesting aesthetic preoccupation that we had at the time. I think I'll end there. Thank, thank you very much. Um, and just to, by the by, I think it's quite interesting that, that um, I mean, this, not having spoken to you at all in the formation of this series, and I thought that, I apologise, but having left messages with all sorts of people, 
Um, we've finally had a lecture which was actually a truly retrospective look at work which went back and forth uh, in, in a way which I found incredibly engaging and in a way that was so, di actually so different from the previous two. Um, also different was the way in which um, you stood and walked and commanded the, the room in a way that um, Chris had sat behind a table <laughs> and that Mike Gold sat in a chair and, um, and quietly uh, and uh, with considerable kind of pathos uh, went through um, the passage of his own work. Um, I enjoyed it immensely but, uh, and I particularly valued the, um, the link with, between Richard Serra's shift piece um, in the landscape um, and the uh, photograph of the lead prop. Um, I can't remember which, which one it is, but the lead roll and slab, which um, seem to me to be <coughs> very powerful. Um, and uh, I wonder whether there are any other, uh, any questions or any thoughts that some people would like to offer? I remember the travel thing was when you had lectures at yeah, it was always the wrong person. This now prevents anyone asking questions. It was always the wrong person to ask the question of Samson. Samson would give a, a fantastic lecture. Questions at the end, the time put out, and it's always some dreadful question. <laughs> well, I, I, I was just going to say that um, I'm just about to put you on the staircase of the Covent Garden project on the front cover of a book. That's the hopeful vision. It's never going to happen. Well, what, what has happened is that the redefining of the geometry to bring the full stage of various up to ground level, so being a basement, precludes the slip file there. So we've had to do a different step. Um, we may live to regret that in some respects, I don't know, because we've had to do a more um, it's a tighter step there, in fact, in some respects, more disciplined. Because the problem with the files there is that it's just put up into the room. And I think it might have felt like that in there. But um, we better do that. That was one of the things I held on to, like, like anything, because everybody was trying to get us to the front cover, so you can make it. But um, <laughs> delighted with it. It's going to be next to Pernese. Right, well. Good cup. Um, <coughs> The, uh, the, the building of the Tatton Tower must have been quite an experience, and I wondered if, uh, I mean, it's a bit of a glib idea, I know, but if everything prior to the Tatton Tower was all foggy, do you think that the enforced working with uh, curved things in three dimensions sort of uh, taught you something and liberated you and let you work in a way which you would have done otherwise? Yes, I think it's interesting to note, as I remember it, that you did the Tatton Tower just before doing the um, I think that's right. Okay. Patent Tower was 71 during the 70s. And then we took the remnants of the Patent Tower up to Derrick. Before the North Hampton, I think remember. But anyway, so in a sense, you could say that it was part of what they wish to break out. That's good. But the other thing I feel about the spiral, the preoccupation again, spiral, spiral mound, and spiral of the Patent Tower, is there's a tendency to drop on pure four. And the sense of spiral is an open-ended pure four. So it's going to be very interesting to stop the time thing. Because it has an absolutely strict geometry. So it's, it's open-ended. Um, Whereas the technical is... Well, well the technical is the same. In other words, um, I think you can include spirals into your set of pure four. Ah. Okay, so... So what, what you're saying is that hitherto, you, prior to that, you know, you you had a um, uh, uh, you had a repertoire of pure forms that you permitted yourself to use, right. and then you know you're <laughs> hanging in force to do this. You suddenly discovered that you could accept. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> it's, a it's a bit like in, uh, it's a bit like the uh, the team of becoming uh, the thirteenth Archimedean pure form. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Especially you. Well, I think I didn't say. Let's say it's one point. You could. At the, at the, discussing the way the London housing project turned to a theory that generalised a, a, a feeling that um, the theory is for a project. In other words, you get the theory after a project, not before. So that 
the theory of the action that comes after doing the, the theory of London comes after doing the uh, analysis scheme. So that tends to come around with a rather perverse view that you don't go into scheme of theory, you develop a theory retrospectively. Um, sort of harm with something that you need to work on. Is that, is that, sorry, um, uh, just one more thing. Is that why you said, at the very beginning, you said that um, uh, architectural thinking is not analytical, linear, logical, and uh, clever, it is not the opposite. Whereas, in fact, most architectural students of our generation are taught to be analytical, linear, logical, and to try and create a format of an analysis, an 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 the analysis of a problem. Well, I think, it, 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 I have a very strong feeling in some of these other talks I've had long in the office, which is um, the mind doesn't work at speeds which are absolutely uncontrollable. You can have half a dozen ideas in a flash of seconds which knit together memories, projections, what you focus on projects in particular days. Um, and I think for, for those both of them, I've often, the moment of going to see a site is the moment you switch on and let all these bits of electricity flow around. So one of the things is not to discuss a project too much until you go to try in order to preserve this moment, which is extremely important for that, you know, a sort of very peculiar thing goes on, which is absolutely dimensionless in the sense of how it's operated. Um, just recently, you know, how, when he began and began thinking of this just this sort of loyalty to one material and a uh, very few form and talking about our generation's effective use of material. And I was really, really thrilled by the, the O kind of this screwing together. I forget that building. I don't know, I just sort of forget where it's just came with the library. Yeah, and, and uh, just sort of thinking, that, putting those two things together in my mind and uh, seeing that there was an update somewhere in the time that you've shown us tonight, this big change. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, the that's right. I think that what we, what we did in the past was to be extremely sophisticated in picking out the principles and overall ideas, and to be very un much too little concerned with the actuality and principles of building. And the way high tech is, is the opposite. High tech is absolutely just that with how to make something. And sometimes one might feel it doesn't draw, let's say, urban justifications or more cultural things. Um, and so I think that it may be that we're at a point where we're looking again much more carefully at what it means to work in certain periods and what, how that might become the part of the fundamental approach to the project. But hopefully you don't lose the other at the same time. Um, I mean, how did that come about? It must have been a very good decision, I mean, to make something all oak, oh, I mean, or all. I mean, no, it, it was, um, I think, exactly what you're picking up, that is, that one being to appear, you draw something like the Opera House, which are always appears in the whole of the world, and the rest of it, so you know, it's turning reactively from that to do a couple of projects, like the lead project, which is in the on the front, and this project, uh, like sort of trying to recapture a, a, an enjoyment and you know, recapture control of things. And it's a very nice thing that has to be tied like that, isn't it? I mean, there's no reason that something shouldn't have some meaning. Yeah. I, I mean, well, I don't know. It could be <coughs> right. I mean, one thing, you know, I think it's terribly worrying that you do things you know, which, which you don't have control. You're made by someone else. You know, you know, the but, but this question of material that you raise by Oaks there, um, I think connects to an area of our training of students here where in the second year we were given a village hall that had to be built in timber. We felt you couldn't use anything else, all timber. First project. The second one was a house for professional person that had to be built in shrimp, nothing else. So 
two arches were, I mean, one body. They compiled it with a factory on the five, on the five parts, the factory so that you could so that you could only use the people. And I think that was an incredibly, uh, recur I mean, I think that's a recurrence. I mean, I, I don't know how you feel about this, so but there was a kind of liberality about using material in a certain kind of way that, that pops up. And, and, and I think your own interpretation of that too, but that movie has some recall to mm. the program that Gowan wrote for this school in 1957, 58. <coughs> I don't know whether yeah, you would yeah, agree with it. I, I, I think that's true, although I could be more personal about it and say that I made part of model, and model into the house, which is where that. One of the things about doing timber building is that you make the building like you make the model. And it's made fact three projects out of with a little um, shop at Clifton Nursery, which is more than um, which is almost directly how one would make the thing if one was making the model. And you know, it's a sort of half truth that does it. Um, I, the fact that one cuts to one from makes it more approachable than you cut. Whereas if you measure something welding, I quite like to learn to weld. Like John, uh, John Winter, who did his house, became a welder, or was a welder. So that the understanding of the material is in part, I think, a particular attachment to the material. But can I just pursue a point where I there's, an, there's, there, there's an ethical dimension to the use of timber, or use of structure, or even the, curri the curriculum structure in, 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 in school. I mean, I, even the course that I went through in, in the mid-70s, um, you, you had the kind of brick building, the timber footbridge, the, the steel building, and the steps. Um, and when I was teaching at the Bartlett, even five years ago, Chris Woodward was still running a course in Fertile, which was a steel house. Brick house. Catching. Catching. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> good idea. <laughs> um, but what's exactly the point of that? I mean, I well, understand the, the, the obvious point of that, but what is, what's the point that's juxtaposing what I'm saying? Because see, I, I think that this whole thing of material and materiality and building it, there's a <coughs> banter around the words, which I'm not accusing you of. But, but, and, and it's something that they banter around about structure, too. I mean, one indicates the other. I'm sorry, I'm going on with that. But it's, it's the legacy of Lethemy and others mm. in this country, um, where, where there is, there is a, um, a sense of, of honesty and directness and truth that's ascribed to certain configurations of material and structure, which is not ascribable to others. And I think it's the way that that's, for me, what's very valuable about retrospective lecture series of this sort is that, it, is that it touches on all sorts of, of issues that arise um, consciously or not um, in architectural education and in architectural practice which are not necessarily played out in a fully kind of articulated way but are there nevertheless and there is this undercurrent I think and I think it's there like you, as you were saying about the the rug one has a competition on the left field scheme, its relationship to the romantic and the romantic aspect of the country is as much to do with this kind of strange mediated view of morality and truth and, and uh, kind of rightness uh, uh, like that, that combined in a programmatic with some. Well, I think the words you're using are not kind of in, in the air now, and they're not words that are personal to the way in which these projects are formed. Mm -hmm. Sorry, there's another. Just on, on a slightly different tack, one, one cannot but be the length of the extraordinary journey that the few chaps have been on over the 25 years. I mean, you know, the completely irrational um, work, the early work. Uh, later. And one doesn't see much uh, of the assignment, and it's a set of relevant respect. 
on the open switch, so we find them as a, as a desperate re personal reprogramming. And again, I say this with great respect and reverence to um, the system, um, the system. But one wonders whether you, in fact, um, feel that you wouldn't let by examples and teaching and uh, examples they work and the teaching of them uh, by them of, of you. And um, I, I refer back to a phrase in you, so I think you said of the tensions and how things we need by the week to the house. It was a device to lay you to be both or to work to be both new and part of the historical context. So if one starts looking at the uh, work of the author house, we've got square and then the, the, the um, repairing of the north east side of the world is to somehow reintegrate um, that other's marketplace which came from the later back into some meaningful relationship with that part of the square and the area part. And there's this tremendous sensitivity in there which was, which was never in any of your earlier work and, and of course perhaps uh, not evident in some of the examples uh, of, of work by, by um, Chibuskiel. And I, I find this an extraordinary thing. I, I'd be very interested to know whether it is in fact a conscious repairing of misadvice and misteaching, or whether you can do it as a, as a, as a natural progression. Well, it's a very generous translation of the generation, which I think that it could easily, equally require its confusion. And, and one of the common things that we got over to is that the object is now a focus and direct. <coughs> Their work come what may in certain ways. Obviously, the Chippewa is actually quite an example. Quite an example of the Chippewa lecture and the good work coming up. And he's supporting that work by really a, a um, dismissive attitude when he is making these works in that context or thinking of the rest of it. And I think I'm forever caught, you feel like I've caught them too soon because I can see. I'm, I'm proud, <laughs> caught, caught school, because I can see Absolutely, the reason for getting the position you've got in the last house. But when it comes to that arcade building, how to actually do it other than accept that we've done it and it's been drawn up and now it's like that thing's like we built. We just need it there and all the other bit. Um, almost impossible to re tackle the task of how to handle the arcade building now with the other than the one who's something much more local and we'd probably fall apart in this direction. I wanted to uh, take that one because I think the typical lecture was interesting. Um, the, we, we don't have any problem really in doing a very sort of modernist interior inside the existing Victorian building. Mm. Um, mm. But when it comes to actually designing a brand new building, and you want to, uh, you would see yourself as a modernist as typical of that, the problem the exterior seems to be quite a crisis. Um, and yet, yeah, you seem to be able to cope with that. Now, I, I don't know, perhaps the interiors of new buildings aren't as um, uh, so concerned with modern, modernist spaces in the other years, but um, it would appear to me. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder whether you, you see yourself as um, having actually got over this problem. No, I'm afraid we're into things that are so close to what I don't know. We discovered my dream. I really don't. I don't have a very much to sort that out and see what happens. Would you feel easy with what you're doing? The dangerous aspect of the Opera House project for myself and probably my personal affairs is that it goes on for a long time. And if you're the sort of person who likes to range around a bit and be a little bit promiscuous mm -hmm. with your thoughts on aspects of that business, a ten year gap can be very awkward because we've moved on a lot of um, And the hope of the Opera House project is that by <coughs> setting up something that's extremely simple to start to move, behind which there are a lot of different buildings that can develop in different ways, we've already radically changed all of it except the arcade. The arcade stands there, the doesn't the one that will be not be changed. Um, and yet, I don't know, I'm going to pass back to bed and say, he's just been booked. He's just been booked. He's just been painted very carefully. Can I ask something about, you, you put it inside of the Hans Dolgast's re-working yeah. um, yeah. yeah. of the Art of Catholic yeah. Munich. And um, uh, 
I wondered whether there was a conscious relation established between yeah, those South German architects like Theodor Fischer and Great German English, Goldbast, and, and others who worked in, in a way which was uh, making um, very, very direct locations of, of, of the Siberian period, mm -hmm. and yet at the same time exploring um, <clears throat> and, and exploring building technologies where, which were essentially primitive, like brick and light and so on, and yet trying to represent them in a way that was, uh, in a way which had challenged perhaps a spack or something like that, would, would be seen as something quite uh, unique and, and pushing forward. Sound like some people, well, they sound like some people I should have a look at. I don't, I don't, <laughs> don't, don't, not, and I'm not being joking. I just don't. I, I, I know the Dolgast things from the exhibition. I don't know some of the other references they're making. But the Dolgast one was just after finishing these, happening to go to Munich, seeing this thing, and realizing that for probably a completely different moment, whatever it was, exactly the same thing of observing the, the, the accident in a very direct way. Um, and making an aesthetic out of that, or some, you know, the probably motives are not related. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't, yeah. I don't have the theoretical knowledge. Well, there's background. also that thing about um, which I'm, I was at Bath University, and Michael Gordon was used to go on and on and on about the way in which uh, there was that, just certain attitudes to conservation of these sorts of altar pieces, some of which involved painting and then scratching through it very mm -hmm. gently, so, or, or painting in such a way where the brush marks ran in different directions. The difference is not evident on the inside. Mm. That's interesting. Mm. You're quite right.